And this morning we're going to be preaching out of, uh, mostly out of Joel, but also the book of Acts. My hope is that at the end we'll have an altar call. We'll ask the Lord uh, to fill us up with more of His Holy Spirit. Amen. If you need healing this morning, we're going to ask you to come up and pray for you. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by some chance, we want you to come up and receive the Lord. Uh, but this morning I titled my message, Lord, Send Your Rain. And really, we're gonna, once again, we're going to be talking out of the, the book of Joel, which is, a, uh, which is one of the Old Testament prophets. And much of the context that we'll be talking about within the book itself, you'll see a lot of imagery that's describing drought, the land. If you go on and you read the book for yourself, because I only took out certain passages, but there's terminology that describes the land as being burnt. Um, and it's the idea behind it is that there's drought, there's famine, there's actually invasion from, from an army that's mul that, that has, is so numerous that it's like locusts. And, and, it, and it reacts or behaves itself like a lion that would bring destruction. And because of the drought and because of the judgment that God's bringing on the land, there's famine. And there's also in the book a call to war. The trumpet is being sounded to, to bring an assembly together. He's, he's calling on the people to bring a congregation and an assembly because of the severity of the situation that's taking place. And that there's going to be a war. That's gonna that's gonna happen, and but and then there's gonna be supernatural signs uh, from heaven, you know, regarding the sun and the moon and the stars, and all of these things take place within this small. In the English version of our Bible, it's only three chapters. In the Hebrew version, they actually had four. It's a very small book, but within the context of Joel, there's a literal truth that's being fulfilled right then and there for God's people but also this book is very prophetic and it speaks of day, it, some things that were fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts and we're going to mention that but also times that are going to come in the future whenever judgment is actually going to come upon the land uh, real quick I just was going to try to give you a little bit of context of where we are you know I like to draw the little map a lot and so uh, here we have the, the uh, Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. And so <clears throat> there was a time frame whenever during Solomon's reign, whenever the kingdom was split in two. And we, we know that because of the, the choices that he made, the disobedience that he did. God split the kingdom in two. And so the northern kingdom was called Israel. Now there's other times where you will see that Prophetically, God will use the word Ephraim, which was one of the northern tribes located up here to describe the northern part of Israel. But nevertheless, the, the northern kingdom was known as Israel and the southern kingdom was known as Judah. I'm just trying to give you a time frame for where we are in the book of Joel. There was also over here to the east, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River. And then up here, there was the land, the, the nation that we would call Assyria. Way back here during the time frame of Genesis 11, the man named Nimrod that we've heard of, he actually developed this whole area here, Assyria. And, the, and if you'll become familiar with the capital of Assyria was actually Nineveh. If you remember the story of Jonah, that Jonah actually ministered to Nineveh to get them to repent. But all this land here was known as the Plain of Shinar. And this is the area that Nimrod actually originally developed. Now, whenever we're talking in Joel, this is actually right after the flood took place. This is more like around 726 B.C. of the prophet Joel, somewhere around there. And the reason I say that is because of the fact that it's around this time that the Assyrian Empire came and actually, they're, they're known as the northern kingdom spoken of right here. And they came and they uh, inhabited, I'm sorry, they overtook the northern part of Israel. They overtook Israel. And then it was about 586 B.C. that later on Babylon, also known as another country from the north, came and took over Judah. So God was bringing judgment on his people and he was using the enemies of God in order to do that. Truth be told, sometimes God still does the same. He allows judgment to happen in the lives of his people, right? Chastisement and correction and discipline. And he'll use various 
forms in various circumstances, sometimes in ways that we don't understand, sometimes in ways that can really cause frustration in our life. And in the front, sometimes people on the outside looking in, especially people that don't know the Lord, all they see is the negative aspect, how it's affecting your life, right? Whenever things are happening that God has allowed to happen in your life. But I can tell you that if you read the book of Job and you'll see all of the devastation, all of the, the bad things that are happening. In the end, the Bible says that God's temple is there. The Bible says that God's presence is there. God, the Bible says that God brings restoration. So maybe you feel like, hey, <clears throat> I feel like I got a drought in my life this morning. I feel like I have a drought in my life. I feel like there's a famine going on. I feel like there's things that are happening. God's allowed a door to open up and is bringing frustration in my life. Well, I have good news for you. Because as long as you love the Lord and as long as you desire to serve him and as long as you will serve him, <clears throat> that God will bring triumph where there was tragedy. Right. Now, what you and I have to learn to do is we have to learn to ignore the naysayers. People try to be experts on the Bible and they try to be experts on the things of God. And they don't even know the first thing about the Bible. And they think that because they read a couple of verses and they can quote them out of context that they know a little something. But the reality is, is that we know that learning the Bible is a lifelong process. Serving God is a lifelong process. Amen. That requires sometimes there's some stumbling. Sometimes there's some failings. But good news, God's in the redemption business, the restoration business. And that's really what the ultimate aspect of this story is about is that God wants to restore God wants to fill up God wants to pour out his spirit on his people because God has a plan amen so let's take a look at Joel chapter 1 and we'll look at verses 1 through 5 it says the word of the Lord came to Joel the son of Pethuel hear this ye old men and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land has this been been in your days or even in the days of your fathers. Tell your children of it. And let your children tell their children. And their children another generation. So basically he's saying. He's calling the old men. And he's saying hey. He's describing something that has longevity. He's like we want you to know. That you old men that have been around for a little while. Have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen anything like what the Lord, what's happening, what's going to happen, the judgment that's coming upon the land? We want to know, have you ever experienced anything like this in your life? So what we need to understand is that the direct context is that there's a lot of judgment that's happening to God's people, a lot of judgment that's happening to the land. But what we also need to understand is that prophetically, there's coming a day that's going to surpass that day. Amen. Prophetically, there's coming a day of destruction and judgment on the, on the earth. Destruction and judgment on the unbeliever that's going to surpass even what Joel was talking about to literal northern kingdom of Israel right then and there. And so as you hear what, was, what Joel was prophesying, it should begin to stir our hearts knowing that this is what's going to happen to the world. And he, and he says, this is what's going to happen. That which the palmer worm has left, the locust has eaten. That which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. That which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. There's a lot of devastation that's happening. If you've ever seen someone who has chosen a complete life of sin, you've probably had people in your family that have done that. You know, I mean, listen, we all fall short of the glory of God, but you've seen the difference between people who desire to serve God and people that just full force give their life to, the, to sin, to a life of sin. And the results of it sometimes, many times, can be really drastic. Yeah. And you see the imagery, that which the locust has left, the palmer worm took. That which the palmer worm left, the canker worm took. It's like one thing after another, loss after loss. And, and, and the seriousness of, of what's taking place with the judgment that's happening. And he, he begins to tell the people that, that have lived their life drinking wine that they need to wake up. They need to wake up. And so the prophet Joel is warning of judgment on the land. And the Lord has him describe, once again, this loss and catastrophe. And the main, the main thrust, though, speaks about harvest. Because literally what's happening is, is the locust and the palmer worm and the canker worm are eating the harvest. 
They're, they're, they're destroying the foliage. They're destroying. They're, they're, there's also the idea of a drought. No rain from heaven. And, and see, Israel, as an agrarian society, depended upon the harvest. They depended on the harvest to eat, right? And, um, you know, that there's no question that the prophet, if you read the book, is not only speaking to Israel where they are currently at the time of this prophecy, but he speaks to the future. Once again, much of this book is, is, speaks of a future day, a day whenever God's going to bring judgment on the unbelievers. In the end there, what we read was he made reference to the drunkards. He's telling them to wake up. And there's so many references in the New Testament about the people of God being spiritually sober. Not being drunk spiritually, but to be spiritually sober so that you're aware of what's happening. I mean, you can literally sleep through the entire judgment period if you had wine to drink, but he's saying you need to wake up, drunkard, because guess what? The harvest is so destroyed. There's no vine. There's no grape left. There's not going to be any new wine for you to drink. You need to wake up. And the point that I want to make with that is, is once again, is that God, amen, is he, he completely, he all oftentimes references being spiritually sober. As a matter of fact, in Romans 13, 11, he says, and that uh, this is the Apostle Paul, Romans 13, 11. <laughs> and that now and that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. God wanted the drunkard to wake up then. God wants us to be awake spiritually now. He wants us to be concerned about and aware of the harvest. Amen. So much of the theme has to do with Old Testament harvest. God wants us to be aware that he has a harvest. Amen. And that it's not about <coughs> grapes and wheat and barley, but that it's about human souls. And at the end of that Romans passage, he says, awake out of our sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. He says our salvation is nearer than when we believe. One of the things that we understand, you know, I can confidently stand up here and tell you that we're nearing the end. <laughs> and the reason that I know that is because on the day that the church came into beginning was the beginning of the end. Right. It was the beginning of the last days. And, and, the, and, and even the Apostle Paul says that each and every day that we wake up, our salvation is nearer. Now, don't misunderstand me. We're already saved, but we're going to be saved right. because there comes a day when salvation will be fulfilled. I don't care how holy we think we are until we get rid of this corruptible flesh and put on that which is incorruption until mortality puts on immortality, then there's still a, a corrupted nature on the inside of us that's constantly trying to drive us away from the plan of God and the things of God, right? And so that's what, what's going on here is, is that we're nearing salvation. God wants us to be awake. He wants us to be aware that there's a harvest Amen. That he is concerned about. It goes on in Joel 1 verses 6 through 7. Some of the same concept here, but just a little bit deeper maybe. For a nation is come up upon my land strong and without numbers. So not only do we have famine, not only do we have drought, not only is the canker worm and the palmer worm, but now, but now there's a warning of a, of a nation. What I explained to you. I'm going to use the Assyrians against you. God uses uh, the enemy as a tool in his hand. And, and, he do, and he's done it for years. <clears throat> but he, he, whenever he uses them, he also judges them because they never do it the way that God would have wanted to do it. They always, they, you know, they always try to because they're, because they're evil, right? And, and, they're, and they're doing it for their own purposes. God always has a word, though, for the believer. Amen. Hey. Hold on. Trust me in the midst of everything that you're going through. Because no matter how bad it looks, I'm here for you. And I will restore you. Amen. When it's all said and done. And so he says, there's a nation that has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. And he has the cheek teeth of a great lion. He has laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. Now there's... In the New Testament, I'm just letting you know, especially in the book of Revelation, it talks about the vine of the earth. 
It talks about the fact that God is going to throw in the sickle and he's going to harvest this earth. Uh, and once again, that's the harvest concept. But this earth belongs to God. I want to make that point when we're on this little part of the passage. The, or even though it doesn't look like it. Even if you have conversations with people that are like, hmm, where's God? The Bible warns us in, 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 in the book of Peter, 1 Peter, I believe it's 3 verse 9. It talks about the, the, in the end days scoffers coming. And that where, where is he? Oh, they've been saying he's coming since, the, since so long ago, right? And, but, but, and that's what even Paul was saying back when. I've even had some family members that are like, well, look, Paul said he was coming and, and, and he caused confusion. No, Paul didn't cause confusion. He actually corrected all of them because their mindset was wrong. But nevertheless, Paul said the Lord's about to show up. Yeah. And, and in every generation, the Holy Spirit has moved upon the heart of God's people to say, hey, awake out of your sleep and be aware that the end is near and that there's a harvest that must take place. Amen? Amen. And right here he's describing this enemy, this nation, as a, as a lion. He's described them as locusts, right? And the devouring uh, concepts of what they were doing. But here he's talking about a lion. A lion that's laid waste to the, to the vineyard. And barked my fig tree. You know, in the New Testament, there's parables about the fig tree. And it's very obvious that it's talking about Israel. This is a perfect Old Testament example of God saying, my fig tree. So I'm, he's talking about his people, his nation. Okay. And, and this, this lion, I did a little bit of research on lions because I don't know. I don't know too much about animals really. But I do know that deer have a certain way of... They are, in rutting season, they'll rub their antlers up against the tree to kind of mark a spot of some sort. It has something to do with their mating season. We'll come to find out lions will do the same thing. Big cats will do the same thing. They'll scratch and bark a tree to remove. To, it's almost like they're marking their territory in some way, shape, or form. So what this lion is doing is he's the, he's the tool of the enemy, but he's coming in and he's marking the territory that belongs to God and he's saying that it belongs to him. And so... The, the, and, and, it's, and it's ripping apart the branches. It's leaving them bare. It's leaving them white. He's describing harvest devastation previously from the swarm of locusts. Now he describes an enemy that will enter the land like a lion. Whether it's the locust, whether it's the lion, the foliage is eaten up. The trees are barked. The branches are white. There's destruction that's taking place. Most of us know that in the New Testament, according to 1 Peter 5, 8, that our enemy is like a lion. Our enemy, the Bible says, for us to be sober. Here, here again, we see the, 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 the command or the, the charge, if you will, to be spiritually sober, to be vigilant. You got to be steadfast. You got to persevere. Sometimes things don't go the way that you want them to. But we're either going to serve the Lord or we're not. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. When God gives them the opportunity, listen, the enemy is looking for any opportunity that he can to come in. Many times there's things in our lives that don't seem like they're that big of a deal. But then the next thing you know, whenever the enemy has his way with it, he perverts it, he turns it around, he causes it to be this huge situation, right? Yeah. And the enemy is look, he's like a lion and he's seeking whom he may devour. And the whole purpose of this lion, talking about the devil now, is to destroy the harvest of God. I'm telling you right now, he wants to destroy the plan of God. And ultimately, the plan of God has to do with the harvest. Because God is creating a family of people. And it's going to result in a harvest of people from this earth. We've talked about that many times. And while Israel in this book is obviously concerned with the condition of their own situation... And their own harvest, God is concerned about his harvest. And he wants the spiritually drunk to be sober. And he wants his people to wake up and to be aware that there is a lion that's roaming around and marking God's territory as it's his own. And destroying God's creation. This earth did not belong to the devil. This earth does not belong to the Gentile nations. This earth doesn't even belong, this earth doesn't belong to Israel. This earth belongs to Jesus because the Father gave it to him. And one day he is going to take it back. And while we are here on this earth, according to the scripture, God desires for his people to inhabit this land and to be a light in the midst of darkness and to be a voice that speaks truth so that the heathen out there, who's the heathen? Those are the unbelievers, that they might know 
Amen. That there's a real God in heaven that loves them and has a plan for their lives. Now look at this. Joel chapter 1, verses 8 through 13. It says, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth. The corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languishes. Be ye ashamed, O you husbandmen. How, O you vine dressers. So husbandmen and vine dressers, these are, these are people that actually take care of the vineyard. That's what a husbandman is. And it's not the same thing as a bridegroom. A husbandman, that's actually an occupation. And in, in, in this that's what that word meant in the old King James English. It was a person who specifically took care of the vineyard. He, he, that, I don't know why it was called a husbandman, but that's what it was. And there's enough ample proof in the New Testament to make that point. But he's saying you should be ashamed. Because now there's, there's no work for you. Because there's no harvest. And so we see again a connection about God's people because of their disobedience towards God and their refusal to serve him properly. Judgment has come upon the land. Ultimately, it's destroyed the harvest. A big part of the problem is the husband, right? In a sense, this also in the New Testament is a common thing because Israel and the leadership of Israel didn't do what they were supposed to do. Therefore, there, he, God promised that there was going to be a day when he was going to take it away from the people that he had given it to. And he was going to entrust it to a people that did not know him. And what he was talking about was the fact that Gentiles like you and I were going to come into the faith, come into the church age. And we're going to be uh, <clears throat> entrusted with the presence of God and the Holy Amen. Spirit in order to carry the light of God to a dark and world. He says right here, uh, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languishes. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, how you ministers of the altar Come lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. I mean, that right, that part right there, that's part of the sacrificial offerings that took place at the house of God. So not only is the husbandman not have a job because there's no harvest, because there's no harvest, there's no drink offering to offer up in the house of the Lord. Everybody's occupation's dried up and the purposes that they that God had for them is dried up because there's nothing left for them to do. There's so much really terminology in this passage that we just read, but there's one verse, the first verse, that really says it all. It says, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The word lament means to wail, to lament, to wail. What we see here is the imagery of a young virgin girl who's espoused to be married, but her fiance dies. And so instead of her being clothed in her wedding garment, she's now clothed in sackcloth, which is, which is the, the clothing of mourning. And you can see her. She's over here isolated. I don't know. I just get this imagery. I'm looking at her back, and I'm getting too old to kneel down like this. But she just, she's just over here, kneeled down, and, 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 and she's just she's wailing, and she's lamenting, and, and she's full of mourning because everything that she ever hoped for and everything that she ever looked forward to right whenever it was about to go down he dies and what the Lord is trying to get in the hearts of his people is is that this is how severe this situation is you need to be like this virgin that's girded in sackcloth and you need to understand that it's really bad out there God is desiring to get a hold of his people's hearts and to allow them to see what is taking place Joel chapter 1, verse 14 through 15. He says, Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty it shall come. Listen, 
the day of the Lord was happening, a form of judgment was happening for Israel right there. But there's re the reference to the day of the Lord is that it's a day that comes in the future. And we don't have to get overly technical, but many people believe that begins with the rapture of the church. But that's just the beginning of the day of the Lord, because the day of the Lord is really going to come forth with judgment upon the world, upon the unbelieving world, a time known as Jacob's trouble. The purposes of just like the tribulations in your life today, the trials that you face today have a purpose for your life. You need to hear that. God wants you to understand that when you go through tribulation in this world today, God has a purpose for it because he uses tribulation in our life to turn our hearts and our eyes back towards him. Just like in the seven year tribulation, he's going to use that to turn Jacob or Israel's hearts back to him, to turn their eyes back to him because God is not done with the nation of Israel. He says, the day of the Lord, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. He's, because of the severity of this situation, there needs to be a special gathering. He goes on to say in verses 15 through 23 of Joel chapter 2. Joel 2, 15 through 23. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. So once again, you know, we've kind of talked about the trumpet recently when the Feast of Trumpets. Um, the trumpet was blown for various reasons to call an assembly, to, to call a fast. It was blown to signify the Feast of Trumpets. It's blown actually on the Day of Atonement this year because this is a jubilee year. It says in Leviticus 25 that the trumpet would sound in the jubilee year on the Day of Atonement. But it was also blown to prepare the people to know that there was war up ahead. In this particular book, also right now, the trump is being blown to, to pull the people together for an assembly, for a fast, to make them aware of the situation and how grave it is. But there's also a trumpet to be blown at some point in time in here discussing the war that's going to happen. And we're not really going to get into that part of the book of Joel, but when it starts to talk about the war, it's obvious that it's talking about the Battle of Armageddon. And the fact that through that, God is going to reestablish re this earth that we live on for himself. So he says, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and, the, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. There's a lot prophetically we could probably say about that, but we're just kind of staying on the surface interpretation right now. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, Give not thy heritage, thy heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? You know, that was one of the things that Moses told the Lord way back whenever they were leaving. Now, that was much in advance of this. But whenever they were leaving Israel and God told Moses, he said, you need to separate yourself out because I'm about to consume these people. These people, the Lord tells Moses, these people that you brought out of Egypt, I'm about to, I'm, a, I'm going to consume all of them. And he said, then I'm going to make a new people out of you. And Moses said, oh, no, Lord, don't do it. Now I realize now, the more I look at it, I'm like, the Lord was testing Moses' heart right there. But Moses said, no, Lord, don't do that. Because if you do that, then the heathen are going to say, look what their God did. Brought them out of Egypt, delivered them just for the purpose to kill them. And this is kind of like the cry of what God is saying about even in this time frame. The, the prophets crying out, Lord, deliver your people. Don't let the heathen look at the heritage that you created and look down upon them, right? Uh, you and I need to understand that, that sometimes in our own life, even though the world out there may look at the circumstances that are taking place in our life and they may feel that way about us, we need to understand that the Lord is not, does not want his, his heritage or his people to be destroyed, but yet he wants to show up in the midst of our lives and protect us. At the same time, he has a purpose for our lives and a purpose for the trial, and we need to learn, amen, how to trust him through all of that. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land. So whenever we, as God's people, come to him and cry out. Another thing that I want you to know is, is that God wants us to, to feel that way about the lost. That's really what the emphasis of my message this morning has to do with. God's got a harvest. There's people out there that are lost. 
And in a modern day sense, what I'm trying to say is, is that the same way God felt about what was getting ready to happen to the people of God then because of their disobedience, God feels the same way for those that don't even know him today that are living in disobedience. And he wants our hearts as his people, the church, to feel like that poor uh, bride that was sitting over there in the sackcloth lamenting and wailing for the loss of the spiritually dead. God wants our hearts to be connected to his heart in the sense that we would be hungry to see the harvest of God come forth. He says, uh, yes, and, what, and when our heart comes that way, and when their heart submits to him and his ways, uh, he says, and the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn. A reversal. God's, God's throwing a reversal on this and doing a 180. And, and, and that's one of the things that we need to know for our own lives, amen, is that no matter where we are, no matter where we've been, God is just crying out and calling upon our hearts to become right with him because he desires to reverse that. And if you cannot take that if you can't understand. Hey, am I trying to say you can live any old way you want and at the last second say you're sorry? If your heart says that, then your motives are wrong anyway. God sees through all of that. Amen. God don't play games with people in their little fixations in their mind. God knows. Everything's naked before him. Amen. Naked you came into this world. Naked you will depart. You're not going to bring anything with you. The point though is this. Is that when a person's heart truly does come to a place of repentance. When a person's heart truly does line up with God's will. Then what happens is there's a reversal that happens. God shows up. That was the palmer worm and the canker worm and the locust was eating. God's going to restore. And he says that right here. He says I'm going to send you corn and wine and oil. You shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Have you ever felt like your life was a reproach before? You don't have to raise your hand. I don't know why. I didn't really think of this before, but man, back when I was a teenager, dude, I was a mess. I don't think about this a whole lot because it was so long ago. I was the worst kind of druggie, <laughs> really. I mean, I, I'm just saying because I didn't even have a, I didn't have a job. I didn't even really, I didn't sell a lot of drugs because to be honest with you, I didn't want to go to prison. Um, so much of my life, I was like a, kind of like a bum just waiting to get high. I can remember I used to sit on this air conditioner. I just, I'm embarrassed to say it, but it's just true. I used to sit on this air conditioner at a convenience store. It's hard to believe that, you know, all the things God's done in my life. I'd sit on this area, and my dad, every time he'd come to visit, he'd see me sitting there, like, oh, and you don't even want to know what he'd say, but I know it just, it like tore him up, like, what are you doing? I was just sitting there waiting for the next dude to drive up, man, hey dude, let's go do this, or whatever, you know? And I just felt like, really, when I look back on that, what a reproach my life was. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that was, that, I'll be honest with you, that was my reputation. I was just, you know, just looking to party. And didn't care what you thought about me. And, but now to see, to know that when you give your heart to the Lord, and I, that may not be your story, thank God, but you got your own story. You got your own story and there's possibility in your own way. Maybe you weren't as well known as I was because I was pretty well known for that kind of behavior in, in my little city. But, but, and maybe you weren't as well known, but there was a circle of people that knew you. And there was a time when your life was a reproach to the Lord in its own way. Some worse than others, so don't get all high and mighty in here. I was just saying that the worse you were before the Lord, the more glory he gets. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. That's a good word, right? And, and that's really what, what the Lord is saying. You will, I, I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. God wants to, wants to do a work in our lives so that the heathen can see that God changes lives. Yeah. Amen. He says, I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate. With his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utter, utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, O ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. In other words, the grass is going to come back. You're going to have some food to eat. For the tree bears her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice. This is really the, one of the main parts that I wanted you to see out of the book of Joel. 
Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. God wants all of his people involved in this assembly that we talked about to pray, to fast for the situation. He, even the bride in the bridegroom earlier on in the passage, you might have already forgot. But it said, let all everyone show up to the assembly. Let those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom come out of his chamber. Let the bride come out of her closet. Those are really describing that they're, they're, they're in the, right in the process of getting married. In Israel, whenever a Jewish wedding took place, the, the bridegroom didn't have to go to war for at least a year so that they could... Uh, spend the, whole, the first whole year together. God's saying this is more important than that. This is more important than anything that you're focused on on this earth. This is more important than any agenda that you have in your own personal life. This is what I'm doing and you need to come to the assembly. You need to come to this fast and you need to get in line with what it is that I'm doing. God promises that he will restore the harvest. See, he talked about the former rain and the latter rain. That's what I wanted to kind of focus on a little bit. In Israel, because they were an agrarian society, and I've explained this to you before, but you know, Egypt built their crops around the Nile River. It, it flooded at certain times of the year, and then it would go back to normal, and it left very rich soil at, on the delta sides of the Nile, and they would plant their crops there. Israel, on the other hand, depended on rain. Depended on the former rain, which usually took place late winter, early spring, uh, early spring, and then a, four, a latter rain, which took place late summer, early fall. And so the, the first rains prepared the soil to receive the seed, right? And then the latter rains uh, prepared the harvest for the crops that were going to come to, to build them up. Now, but what God's saying right here is, is that he's saying, I'm going to give you a former and a latter rain all in the same month. He's talking, he's describing something supernatural. I'm going to pour out the rain. I titled this morning's message, Lord, send your rain, right? There was a drought before, but I'm about to give you supernatural rain in order to allow the harvest to come forth. In the New Testament, God poured out the rain also. He poured out the presence of the Holy Spirit, amen, upon the fledgling church. Before it was even prepared, a little group of people, 120 people up in, up in an upper room. And, and living in the midst of the, the mighty Roman Empire. Then Jesus tells him in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, before he ascends to the Father. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, it says, And being assembled together with him. Talking about Jesus. This is before he ascends to the Father. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you have heard of me for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days from now, Jesus is instructing his disciples to wait for him in Jerusalem in the upper room. And what he's telling them is this. He's saying, I want you to wait for a baptism, but it's not a baptism of water. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I explained to you before that we believe in Pentecost, that there's a baptism that's second to the baptism of water, that second to dairy, to a second work of grace to salvation, and that when you get filled up with the Holy Ghost, amen, you receive power from on high in order to be a witness for God because God has a great harvest, amen, and he's desiring to pour out the rain. He's desiring to pour out his spirit, to move upon the hearts of people. It says right here in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. I mean, look, God, Jesus told us that we would know the seasons through the sign of the times. Even he talked about the fig tree. He said, whenever the branch is tender and you see the leaf, you know summer is near, just in a similar fashion. When you see all these things, you know that it's about to go down. So he told us we would know the season, but the kingdom hadn't even got started good yet. Jesus just died on the cross. He hadn't even ascended to the Father. And the disciples wanted to know, hey, when are you coming back? Jesus is like, what you need to focus on is the harvest right here, right? And he says, uh, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Lord said that we would know the season of his coming, but he wants us to be witnesses, right? We can't forget 
in the midst of our own life, whenever there's trial and things taking place, that there's a lion out there with fang teeth, and he's barking God's tree, and he's marking his territory, and he's saying this earth belongs to him, and he's trying to destroy God's harvest. We have to remain focused on the fact that God is concerned about his harvest. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. It says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit came upon them, filled them up, and somewhere from on the inside of them, the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. They didn't create the utterance. They didn't make it happen. But yet at the same time, they spoke what the Holy Spirit gave to them. Amen. When the people were filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, some in the crowd thought that they were drunk. That's what happened. They're like, look at these people, they're drunk. It's not even, it's barely morning time and, and they're already drunk. And the apostle and Peter said, no, that's not what's going on here. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. <clears throat> but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaids. I just want to point out to you that the prophet Joel in the Old Testament talked about the fact that young men would have visions. Old men would dream dreams. Servants would be operating in ministry. The handmaidens, the young women would, would operate in ministry because he was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh in the end days. And God was going to use them to speak, to prophesy. And he was going to show wonders in the heavens and signs on the earth. And that he's talking about the end now. It, it, this is the whole time frame of the church age that it culminates and climaxes with the day of the Lord that is going to happen upon this earth, that the sun's going to turn black, that the moon's going to turn red, right, with blood, and that the stars in the heaven are going to quit giving their light, and that there's going to be devastation and destruction that's going to happen on the earth in the last seven years, and that during that time frame, Israel is going to be, turned, their heart's going to be turned back towards it. But in the meantime, in the church age, God's pouring his spirit out upon all flesh. Flesh, for young women, for old men, whoever you may be, in order for you to prophesy, to speak forth the truth of God's word to a lost and a dying world. He goes on to say at the end, he says, that great and notable day of the Lord shall come and it shall come to pass. This is actually the last verse is verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And see, if you read on, and, and we've talked about this before, 3,000 people get saved whenever Peter stands up and preaches this message. Now, that's a big old crowd to get saved at one time. It's a big difference if you look at Peter's life then compared to where Peter was before the day of Pentecost. He, he had denied the Lord three times. He was running away from the Lord. Went back to fishing. The disciples were following him. He was a leader. They were leaving the ministry. Jesus shows up on the banks of the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias, another name for the Sea of Galilee, and he cooks fish for them. They didn't even recognize him at first, but but he spends and he and he, he pours into Peter's heart. And then Peter and then Peter now filled with the Holy Ghost preaches with the power of the Holy Spirit. See, you and I need the power Amen. of the Holy Spirit That's in our right. life so that we can be witnesses for God. We might not stand up in the middle of the day of Pentecost and see 3,000 people get saved. We might just run into somebody that we used to know at Walmart. But we need the Holy Spirit moving and operating in our lives. We might just be ministering to our unsaved dad, our unsaved mom, our unsaved children. But we need the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in order Amen. to do the ministry of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Joel 2, 23 and 25 again. He says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately. He will cause to come down for you the rain 
the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore you to the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and my great army. That I see, we talked about the, the former the former rains and the latter rains. Now, there's no way for me to absolutely prove this, and so that's why I'm going to tell you this. But many Pentecostal people believe that the former rain would be noted as the day of Pentecost that took place on this day that we speak of, right? And some people just preach this as that it's absolutely true. And to be, I mean, a lot of people preach it that way. I'm, see, I'm, I'm a little bit of a different preacher because I'm going to tell you that if it's my opinion, then, then I'm going to tell you that it's more my opinion. Even if other preachers told you that that's definitely what it was, if I don't feel like it can be proven absolutely from the scriptures, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to, see, because if I just act like it is, a lot of times, I'm not saying y'all, but a lot of people in the church don't even read their Bible. So I could get away with saying a whole lot of stuff up here that you wouldn't even know. Hey, oh, man, the preacher said that that was that. No, 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 that's not how I roll. I'm going to sit here and tell you what I, what I believe based upon what I find from the scriptures. But in Pentecost, they talk about the former rain and the latter rain. And what they say is that the former rain took place on the day of Pentecost. In other words, when the Holy Spirit descended with like cloven tongues of fire and the people were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak with other tongues. Peter filled with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, send your rain. Preaches that first Holy Ghost message and 3,000 people get saved. The former rain. It, it prepared the soil of the, of the time frame of human history to receive the seed of the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ spread through the Roman Empire like fire. It was preparing the soil of the earth to be receptive to the truth of God's word. That's the gospel. Amen. I can tell you that that's what the purpose of the former reign was and I can tell you that that's what happened. Amen. And that's not Matt's opinion. That's the gospel right there. But where it gets a little bit more is something called the Azusa Street Revival. If you've never heard of it before, I'm going to tell you just real quick. Don't want to spit, take up too much time. But in 1906, there was an African-American man that lived right there in Centerville, Louisiana. He had one eye. His name was William Seymour. And he was a, a holiness preacher. But it was before Pentecost really hit. When I say Pentecost, Pentecost had happened in the, in the book of Acts. But there was a time frame that happened in the church age where you didn't see a whole lot of people preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You didn't see a whole lot of people getting filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. It had, it had kind of dwindled away. People weren't really preaching it. They weren't preaching that aspect. Many Baptist scholars believed that that was for the there and then and that it wasn't for the here and now. But all of a sudden, there were people that were hungry. There were people that were hungry for a move of God. There were people that were hungry that the Holy Spirit would move. And they were like, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why would he have, if he did something then, why would he do something different today? God's still about to harvest as much today as he was then. And they began to seek the scriptures. And they began to see the passages where the Holy Spirit was poured out. And that God would use people through the anointing. Amen. And, that, and they saw repeatedly how people would speak with other tongues. But that there was a power that was connected to it. And that the Holy Spirit would move in the lives of people. William Seymour was on his way to California, to Los Angeles, to take over a, 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 a church there that there wasn't really a Pentecostal denomination of any sort back in those days because Pentecost really hadn't affected the, the church age of that era. And uh, But he stopped off in, this, in Houston on his way and he listened to the teachings of a man named Charles Parham. Charles Parham had a Bible college in Topeka, Kansas, in a big old two-story white house, and he had all kind of Bible students in there, and he was an, a traveling preacher. And he told his students, he said, I want, he said, I'm telling you right now, there's a second act of grace in the scripture. It's connected to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And when people received that, they received power from God to preach the gospel, and it, caught, it, uh, it turned the, the known world of that time upside down. And he said, I want us to study the scriptures while I'm away and I want us to see can we see a theme a pattern see that's why we teach patterns is there a theme or a pattern in the scriptures 
where it, it points to this. And there was this woman who was an older woman. Her name was Etta something. And she began to read the scriptures over and over again. And she saw this pattern where whenever people, after they had believed in the Lord, would ask to be filled upon by the Holy Spirit, that they would speak with other tongues and that they received power and confidence in order to speak for the Lord. Next thing you know, she brings this to the other students. Next thing you know... Guess what? The, the Holy Spirit falls. They begin to speak in other tongues. And the anointing of God begins to, to, to spread in that situation. Now, that would be one thing if it just happened in this, little, in this little house. You know what I'm saying? Oh, well, they just got a little bit fanatical. You know, they got a hold of some strange fire or something like that. We can't. Well, but anyway, Charles Parham began to teach this stuff. So here's William Seymour. He just drops off, stops off in Houston where Parham's now teaching this. And he listens to his teaching. He couldn't even, from what I understand, couldn't even go into the, to the room where they were teaching because he was a he was an African American man, so he had to kind of sit outside. I can remember one time I went to Swagger's Bible College. Lauren was teaching a night class, and I got off late. And I can remember I didn't want to interrupt the class, so I sat outside. Now that's a whole lot different reason. I was just trying to be respectful, but this poor guy couldn't go into the sanctuary. But he sat outside and he listened to this message. He didn't even get filled with the Holy Ghost. He never spoke in other tongues, but something resonated on the inside of his spirit. He believed what it was that he heard. And he took that message with him. And the first day, he went inside that new church where he was going to be the pastor. And he stood behind that pulpit. And even though he didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he had never spoken other tongues, he preached that message to that congregation. And when he went back for the night service, there were chains that were locked the door. What ended up happening is, is that somebody opened up their home to him and he began to preach this message. And before long, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. People started getting filled with the Holy Spirit. People started, yeah, they spoke in other tongues, but the power of God began to move. Next thing you know, the, the house, the yard, people are, the, the place is filled up. Next thing you know, this revival begins to spread. It doesn't just spread across the nation. It spreads across the whole globe. People start getting filled with the Holy Ghost. They start speaking in other tongues. But the thing about it is, is that it's just not that they spoke in other tongues. It's not just that they sometimes that their behavior seemed so emotional and so excited about the Lord that they became passionate about Jesus. They became passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They began to want to talk about him. He became the topic of their conversation. He, he became everything to them. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to spread the word about Jesus more and more. Listen to me. This was this was during this continued on. You know, and, and through this, Pentecostal denominations were being birthed, right? And, and even during World War II, at first, uh, you know, a lot of times the, in the beginning, Assemblies of God and people like that, they were against the war and things like that. And with time, though, what ended up happening is, is that they said, you know what? This is part of the harvest. And God's got people over there that need to hear the gospel. And the next thing you know, as these Pentecostal people began to just spread through different parts of, the, of life, then the, 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 and even the Baptists back in them days, as much as they were against a lot of that, they could not deny it. This is all in the history of what happened. I've read these books. I did tests on all this. I wrote papers on all this. But my point is this. Even the Baptists who were against it could not deny the power and the, and, the, and the hunger and the passion that these people had for the gospel of Jesus Christ and how they felt as though they had to share the truth of God's story with the lost that were out there. The Baptists had to come to the river because, see, they, listen to me, don't pick on the Baptists because they're evangelical. What does that mean? They want to tell other people about Jesus. Amen? And they might have some different beliefs than what we have, but let me tell you something. Now, a lot of Baptists have told more people about Jesus than many of us in this room. Right? But what I'm trying to get at is, is that even though the Baptists, because some people, some Baptists think that it's of the devil to speak in other tongues. But what I will tell you is this, they could not deny the fact that these people were hungry for Jesus. And that they desired. So what we see is, is that the day of Pentecost was a form of rain. Amen? Preparing the soil of this earth to be receptive to the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that the Azusa Street Revival was like a latter rain. 
preparing the harvest, making it full, getting a bumper crop ready because God desires that his people would have a heart like he does, that would mourn for the loss, that would be like that young virgin girl that lost her fiance because they realize, see, unless the Holy Spirit moves on your heart, I'm talking to the preacher, unless the Holy Spirit moves on your heart and moves on my heart, I'm much more concerned about what I got going on in my life today than to be like that young virgin girl mourning for the lost crying out for the lost of this world that I don't even know crying out that God would use me as a witness so that others that don't know the Lord would hear listen to me do we believe the Bible that we preach or not is it true that the only way to the Father is through the Son and that the Father sent his Son Jesus to die on the cross and that if people die without Jesus that they die in their own sin if that is true then it seems as though we'd be more awake it seems as though we would, that we, even though the harvest is languishing and the oil is not there because the people are dying around us, it seems like we'd be more awake, that we wouldn't be spiritually drunk. We need to be awakened, amen, by the power of the Holy Spirit that we would be witnesses for the Lord. I know they think that we're crazy. I was over there with a bunch of nurse practitioners yesterday. I'm like, yeah, man, what you been up to, man? I started a church. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Preaching Jesus. Got to share with this girl that I used to talk to. It's a long story. But the point is, there's always opportunities to talk about Amen. Jesus. Amen. And, but we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Amen. Let them think we're crazy if they don't understand. But guess what? They will have known that there was somebody in their little clique, in their little circle of, of life, that tried to tell them that, that Jesus died to set them free. They're empty out there. I'm telling you right now. I'm talking to them. Talking to the people I know anyway. They're empty. They need the Lord. Amen? Amen. So one, one of the things real quick that you see. I know I need to hustle up. One of the things that you see in the Old Testament is that God's Spirit anointed the priests, the kings, and the prophets. Right? We, we've talked about that. David got anointed. God's Spirit would, would, would fill up. The Old Testament kings, prophets, priests. Why? So that they could do the work of the ministry. This is an interesting passage of scripture out of Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 through 29. Moses, up to this point, has been in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord has given him something to say. <coughs> it says, and so now Moses leaves the presence of the Lord. It says, and Moses went out. And told the people the word of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him, Moses, and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So you see the picture here. God's got God's spirit has already been poured upon Moses. Moses is doing the work of the Lord. Now the same spirit that rested on Moses has been given to 70 men, and they start to prophesy for the Lord. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, the name of the other Medad, and the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out of, into the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses. So he takes off, man. He's over there in the camp, this young man. He's like, look at them. They're over here in the camp. And they're prophesying just like everybody else is prophesying over there by the tabernacle. They're not supposed to be doing that. And he takes off running to go find Moses. He's a little, he's a, he's a little tattletale. Yeah, have you ever seen tattletales? Why does he got tattletales today? Oh, I got to go tattletale. Don't like the way they're doing this over there, doing that over there. You know, instead of praying and bringing it to let me go tattletale on you. Lord Jesus, help us. Let's grow up, right? <laughs> but went not out into the tabernacle. They prophesied in the camp. Okay. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Even Joshua got caught up in this. Forbid them. Don't let them prophesy. Moses. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? In other words, you want me, you want, you're, you're, you have a problem with envy towards these men that are being used by God because of me? I don't think you get it, Josh. As much as you do get the plan of God, you ain't getting this right here. He goes on to say this. He says, I would, that's what he's saying, would, I wish, oh, it would be beautiful if 
that God, all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon all them. And then we go back to what Peter said about what Joel said. And he said, there's coming a day when God will pour out his spirit and that the young handmaid is going to prophesy. The old man is going to see vision. The young man is going to dream dreams. I might have gotten that cross reference, but you get the point. That God's spirit was going to fall upon all flesh that desired to be saved, that desired to be used by the Lord. And that's what Pentecost is all about.